Good afternoon. The first item of business today is topical questions, uh, general questions, sorry, portfolio, portfolio questions. <laughs> as long as you're, as long as we're clear. Portfolio questions. Number one has not been lodged. Question two, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the reported reduction in revenue uh, grant from the Scottish Funding Council has had on the University of Aberdeen and Robert Gordon University. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. Notwithstanding the context of continued UK Government fiscal austerity, the Scottish Government has, for the fifth year in succession, invested more than £1 billion in Scotland's universities in 2016 17. The University of Aberdeen and Robert Gordon University, alongside all other of Scotland's higher education institutions, continue to benefit from this substantial investment, which enables them to attract a range of additional funding. Louis MacDonald. Well, I'm sorry the Minister didn't uh, see fit to answer the question about the impact of the reduced funding on these universities, because, of course, she will acknowledge that Aberdeen and RGU had among the largest reductions in teaching, research and innovation grants in the current financial year, losing 3.9% of those grants. And, and she will also be aware that both have since made staff redundant and that further redundancies are planned. In light of the impact of this year's cut, can the Minister say today whether universities in the North East should expect to be among the hardest hit again when indicative grant figures are published for the next financial year, or will Ministers this time take a different approach? Minister. Well, decisions on funding for individual institutions are made by the Scottish Funding Council and take a number of factors into consideration. This may be a challenging settlement for some universities and it does come at a challenging time for the North East. But we are working with the Scottish Funding Council and the sector to ensure that we secure greater efficiencies, maintain the benefits for learners and ensure core outcomes remain a key priority. Decisions for future years will be undertaken as part of the spending review. Julian Martin. To ask the Scottish Government what their assessment is of the risks posed to universities in Scotland by the double hit of withdrawing from the European Union and its research funding programmes and the reluctance of the UK Government to consider Scottish universities as being eligible for post-study work visa programmes. Minister. Well, Scotland is a very outward-looking and inclusive country, and it's benefited both socially, economically and culturally from the students, from the, est, the rest of the EU coming to study here, and, of course, from the EU researchers and staff that we have. The, the consistent UK government ambiguity on the status of the EU nationals and the plan point of Brexit is indeed hampering our universities, including those in the North East, to protect Scotland's interests. We will be considering how we can ensure that higher and further education sectors continue to attract the best students from the EU and globally. And we are, of course, disappointed that the universities are being excluded from the English Tier 4 visa pilot. And we continue to press the UK government to introduce a post-study work visa in Scotland that meets the needs of our universities and our economy. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, President Officer. In spite of her protestations in reply to Mr Macdonald, the reason... Audit Scotland report made clear that funding for higher education has in fact fallen uh, year on year in recent years. So will the Minister simply commit to protecting the higher education budget in next year's budget due next month? Minister. Uh, despite Ian Gray's um, invitation, I am not going to write Derek Mackay's budget um, today. Question number three, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government what financial support it provides to Murray College UHI? Minister Shirley Ann. Murray College funding is provided through the Regional Strategic Board of the University of the Highlands and Islands. A combination of grant funding from the Scottish Funding Council and UHI provided a total of £8.467 million in 2014 15 financial year. In 2015 16, the amount of funding through UHI Regional Strategic Board for the academic year was £8.483 million. We should look at Thank the Minister very much for her answer. Uh, she may be aware that Murray College UHI and my constituency have provided evidence that they are underfunded by the time the funds go to the regional strategic body and are divided amongst the various colleges by around 10%, which equates to around half a million pounds for their budget. And I also understand the Scottish Funding Council are now giving technical support for that allocation formula to be reviewed. I'd be very grateful she could investigate this issue because clearly the college has been underfunded in recent times and hopefully now we can fix the formula so that, that doesn't continue here on in. But clearly to develop new degrees and do its good work, we need to have an equitable share of the funding for Murray College UHI. Minister. 
example, the distribution of funding for UHI colleges is a matter for the regional strategic body, UHI. And to that end, I understand that UHI remains in uh, very active discussions with Morrow College for its funding for the future years and is indeed waiting further material for the college to move that process forward. So I'm sure that UHI will want to ensure an equitable settlement for the colleges across its region, consistent with the envelope of funding available. Since this is more a matter for UHI, I will ask them to respond directly to the member with further detail and keep, up, keep him updated. Question number four, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it has introduced to assist the college sector in responding to the needs of employers. Minister. The college sector has an increased involvement from employers as a result of the college merger process and through the outcome agreements with the Scottish Funding Council, colleges are committed to delivering vocational pathways, apprenticeships and workplace learning in partnership with employ employers. Understood. I thank the Minister for her answer. Over the course of the first eight years of the SNP Government, the number of part-time students over the age of 25 fell from 179,685 in 2007-8 to 82,402 in 2014-15. This is a staggering reduction of 54%. Will the Scottish Government commit to revising their decimation of the college places and improve the current situation forced upon students and employers? Minister. Well, the Scottish Government has a target of full-time equivalent places of 116,000 places and we have um, fulfilled that target. We are ensuring that the places that we have at, at colleges um, are based on around what the economy needs. Um, that doesn't just include full-time places, it does include part-time places and those are funded. They're particularly funded to ensure that they are based on the needs of the local economy and of local employers and that is for both part-time and full-time courses. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've recently learned of a, a fascinating trade skill that is carried out, which is scientific glass blowing, which is carried out in East Kilbride. And uh, it struck me that there are recognised skill shortages coming up, and I've been told that for scientific glass blowing there is a great concern about a future skills shortage. And I, I wonder whether there are particular incentives, initiatives, help that can be given to start up college courses where there is a recognised potential skill shortage. Minister. Well, colleges do respond very well to meet the demands for um, the, the, the um, employment demands in their area from particular employers. And Linda Fabiani mentions one that's very specific to her area. Um, I believe uh, with uh, regards to scientific glass blowing, the uh, Society of Scientific Glass Blowing has applied to the SQA um, for um, an awards qualification. Um, and in due course, if that qualification um, um, is granted, then colleges could offer that um, and ensure that people have um, um, a demand that, that can be met for that um, and the progression route into existing higher education courses. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Audit Scotland report published over the summer on colleges identifies that there has been a 6% fall in teaching numbers. It also cites Unison and EIS surveys indicating high levels of dissatisfaction. What is the impact of this reduction in teaching numbers on the ability of Scotland's colleges to deliver high quality education? Minister. And the Audit Scotland report for colleges um, also highlighted that um, a, a student um, uh, the, the feelings of students um, are very positive to, towards the courses that they're having within colleges and there is a high level of satisfaction. I'm very pleased that that's happening um, within uh, the colleges that we have at the moment and in many ways this is due to the, the, the policies that get this government has put in place to ensure that we have a financially uh, stable college sector built on what the economy needs and delivering for the local people. Question number five, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when Ministers last met the EIS and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, I last formally met with the EIS on the 1st of June 2016, where a wide range of issues was discussed. In addition, I addressed their annual general meeting on the 11th of June and their head teachers conference on the 7th of October. The Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science met with the EIS Further Education and Lecturers Association on the 9th of November, and I will see EIS representatives later this afternoon and again in December. Tavish Scott. 
Very grateful. I, I wonder when the Cabinet Secretary meets the IS representatives later this afternoon. He might be prepared to discuss the SQA's performance following the evidence that was provided to the Education Committee this morning, where on the physics higher assessment, uh, it, the committee found that there had been three versions of the assessment in three years and 81 separate pages of guidance. In light of the widespread concerns that have been expressed to the Education Committee of this Parliament on the SQA's, SQA's performance, is the Cabinet Secretary prepared to look at the performance of that organisation in light to those very real concerns. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's very important that the SQA is constantly mindful of the feedback that it receives from various stakeholders within the field of education in preparing the uh, necessary examination processes within the country and to ensure that they command confidence amongst a variety of stakeholders. And, uh, and th that, that is... Um, I say to um, Mr Scott my determination to make sure that the, the, the SQA um, undertakes that, uh, that role, that it uh, engages constructively with a variety of different parties as they prepare for the examination diet. And of course, in my discussions just yesterday with the Chief Executive of the SQA, we were discussing the further raft of changes that have been agreed not by the SQA, but by the Assessment and Qualifications Group, because it's very important to remember that many of the changes and reforms that are made to the system are not made unilaterally by the SQA. They are made after discussion involving a very wide range of stakeholders. And for example, in the assessment and qualifications group, which I personally chair, um, there are about 20 stakeholders around the room and we have to reach agreement about what are the necessary uh, changes to take forward. So I, I can assure Mr Scott that the issues that he raises are issues of which I, that are uppermost in my mind and uppermost in my discussions with the SQA. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The EIS has said any education review must cl clearly set out what benefits it would bring to schools, teachers and pupils. But there remains a great degree of uncertainty surrounding the proposed regional boards. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us today, one, what practical benefits this proposed structural change might bring to teachers and pupils? And two, confirm whether he will once and for all rule out allowing schools to opt out of local authorities. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, on, on the second point, I've already answered that question in Parliament and I've answered it to Mr Gray on previous occasions. Um, on the first point, in terms of practical benefits of regions, what I'm concerned to address is the fact that on the information that's publicly available, um, there is a, a very wide range in performance by local authorities in adding value to the education, educational experience of young people in their schools. And as Cabinet Secretary for Education, I'm not prepared to turn a blind eye to that. It's not good enough that in some parts of the country, some local authorities are not as good as other local authorities in providing educational development resources and support to schools. So one practical benefit uh, of the review that I'm undertaking just now is that young people across the country would benefit from a stronger educational development resource as a, as a, as a, a product of the increased collaboration that the OECD called on us to, to ensure was the case within Scottish education. And that would be deployed not just for some pupils within Scotland, but for all pupils within Scotland, which is my priority as the Education Secretary. Question number six, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to disband the board of the Scottish Funding Council. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, Phase 1 of the Enterprise and Skills Review recommended the creation of a new single strategic Scotland-wide statutory board to coordinate the activities of Scottish Enterprise, Hans Zanz Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. Our intention is that once established, this overarching board will replace individual agency boards while retaining the separate legal status of each of the bodies. Ian Gray. The Cabinet Secretary must be aware of concerns in the sector, uh, that their, the higher education sector, uh, that their autonomy will be compromised if the Funding Council goes in the way that I think he has just described. Mm. Last night, the Minister for Higher Education assured University of Scotland last night that they shouldn't worry. She understood the importance of their autonomy. Uh, I think that they will find those two statements entirely contradictory. Will the Cabinet Secretary think again and ma maintain the Scottish Funding Council and thereby the autonomy of our higher education institutions? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the autonomy of the higher education institutions is derived from the status of the higher education institutions. And there's total consistency between what I've just answered to Parliament 
and the statement that was made by the Minister for Higher and Further Education at the University of Scotland event last night. Um, I, uh, of course, I'm aware of the unease within the university. I can read the newspapers and I can uh, watch BBC Scotland. So, yes, of course, I'm aware of the unease. But I'm also absolutely determined that our university sector will be an autonomous sector able to take forward and to exercise the same academic independence that it has today. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the circumstances around the um, issues in connection with the board of the Scottish Funding Council uh, are issues that we have to handle with great care um, to ensure that we can protect the independence of the university sector and to, uh, to guarantee that there is no reason for the sector to have the concerns that it currently has. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. And Cabinet Secretary, in, in terms of what uh, you've just said and in terms of what the Minister said last night, welcome comments about preserving this autonomy, which was such an issue in the last uh, Parliament. Notwithstanding that, when it comes to phase two, the real concern is that the new board potentially would be chaired by a minister. That's where the concern is about the autonomy issue. In phase two, can you rule out any circumstance where there will be government control of the universities? Well, well, well I, I'm very happy to rule out government control of the universities. Uh, I'll give that absolute cast-iron commitment to Parliament today. There will be no government control of the universities. Uh, as for the, as for the um, arrangements around the exercise of phase two, the government will consult um, comprehensively around these questions. Um, I would point out to members that um, in its response to the publication of the Enterprise and Skills Review, Universities Scotland said, universities fully support the drive to increase Scotland's productivity and inclusive economic growth, and we believe that Scotland has the assets we need in our research base. We totally agree that Scotland must take a no wrong door approach to businesses, public sector and third sector organisations. University of Scotland went on to say they look forward to close engagement in phase two of the Enterprise and Skills Review, and that's exactly what the government will deliver. Question seven, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many primary school PE specialist teachers there are in this school year. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the 2015 Teacher Census reports there were 156 primary school PE teachers based in schools and 77 local authority centrally employed PE teachers in Scotland. Brian Whittle. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, given the recent worrying report on the continuing decline in the activity of our children, is isn't about time the Scottish Government recognised that physical education is as much a specialism as every other subject. Under the Scottish Government, the number of PE teachers in Scotland has decreased dramatically by 17% since 2011, which was a major area of concern raised to me by teachers at the recent Scottish PE Teachers Conference. The commitment of two uh, periods of PE in schools is hugely devalued if specialist teachers do not take the class. Will the Cabinet Secretary take the physical education of our school children seriously, recruit more primary school PE teachers and reverse this decline in teacher numbers? Cabinet Secretary. I'm, uh, this isn't the first time I've answered a question from Mr Whittle on the issue of physical education in schools. And I'm, I'm genuinely perplexed about what he's trying to achieve in the way in which he characterises the issues of physical education in our schools. Because if I can summarise what I've just heard from Mr Whittle, which is what I heard the last time he uh, questioned me on this subject, was essentially a pretty negative assessment of the presence of physical education within our schools. I've just been to two primary schools this morning. I've just opened two primary schools this morning. It goes to show that the government is building a lot of schools in our country that I had to open two of them, brand new schools this morning. Both of them championing the use of the Daily Mile as part of the physical education activity. Now, if the Daily Mile is not good enough for Mr Whittle, I don't understand what his point is, because the Daily Mile is part of the physical activity of young people in our schools and part of their activity. Now, there's another question which the Conservatives need to wrestle with. Last week, Liz Smith was here, I think it was last week, maybe it was the week before, demanding that we had specialist scientist teachers in our primary schools and we have to have specialist primary teachers and at the same time the Conservatives come here and demand that we've got to have more focus on literacy and numeracy. Now far be it from me to point out that the Conservatives sound to me to be all over the place on their approach to primary education yeah. within this country, yeah. all over the place and worse still 
they are prepared to devalue and to belittle the commitment of the teaching profession to encourage. Well, they, they seem to be prepared to, de, to, be, to, to belittle and to demean the amount of activity and concentration on exercise within our schools. And I would have thought if Mr Whittle wants to influence this debate, he could take a more constructive approach in so doing. Colin Beatty. Could the Cabinet Secretary outline in more detail how the Daily Mile initiative is helping children and young people's future health and well-being? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the focus on the Daily Mile is uh, an integral part of encouraging young, young people to become involved in the daily and regular um, uh, activity of exercise, to take in, an interest in their well-being, which of course is a central part of the broad general education of encouraging young people to be more aware of their health and well-being. And it contributes directly to ensuring that young people are um, exercising on a regular basis, which we all know to be of significant benefit. So the commitment that's been given to the Daily Mile and the support that has been uh, demonstrated towards that has been a, an integral part in taking forward the uh, agenda of encouraging young people to be active and to benefit as a, as a consequence. Question number eight, Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with South Lanarkshire Council on the building of secondary schools. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, Government officials have had no recent discussions with South Lancashire Council regarding the building of secondary schools. I'm aware that all 17 of the Council's secondary schools are currently classified as being in good condition. However, through the Government's Schools for the Future programme, we are currently replacing three primary schools in South Lanarkshire, Spittle Primary, Half, Half Merck Primary and West Mains ASN and Burnside Primary, with the Government providing approximately £11.6 million towards these projects. Clear hockey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Um, there has been significant increase in house building within my constituency of Rutherglen over the past 10 years, particularly in the Halfway and Newton area of Cambus Lang. Unfortunately, poor planning by South Lanarkshire Council means there has been a dearth of facilities to support this otherwise welcome expansion. Whilst there has been new primary school provision in the area, changes to the school catchment areas require pupils in Halfway and Newton to travel considerable distance to attend secondary school. Given the strength of feeling in the community for the provision of a new secondary school in Halfway, what support can the government give to South Lanarkshire Council to progress such an initiative? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the statutory responsibility um, for the planning of school capacity rests with local authorities under the 1980 Education Scotland Act um, and the management of, school, of the school estate um, accordingly as uh, part of their responsibilities. Now, of course, the government has cooperated with South Lancashire Council over a number of projects to enhance that capacity, um, but I recognise the significance of the issues that uh, Claire Hockey raises on behalf of her constituents. I'd be happy to uh, to have further discussions with the member and with South Lancashire Council on this particular question to try to help to do all we can to address the local issue that's been raised. Question number nine, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the EU referendum has led to an increase in hate speech in schools, and if so, what action its Education Directorate is taking to tackle it? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, all forms of hate crime and prejudice are unacceptable. Um, I'm concerned by recent reports from the Murray House School of Education and the Educational Institute of Scotland about incidents of this nature, which highlights the need for constant vigilance. In relation to schools, we want all children and young people to learn tolerance, respect, equality and good citizenship to address and prevent prejudice. I welcome the Equality and Human Rights Commission's interest in the issue of prejudice-based bullying and have sought their input into the development of the refreshed national anti-bullying strategy for children and young people. I will con carefully consider the issues raised by um, the, uh, the, the committee, as well as anything further that can be done to support our diverse communities over and above our holistic approach to anti-bullying. Gail Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer, and he's essentially answered my supplementary at the same time, so thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent timekeeping. Ten, question 10, Alison Harris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that gifted and talented pupils in all schools are properly supported. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, under the Additional Support for Learning Act, education authorities must identify and provide the support that their pupils require to overcome barriers to learning. 
This includes the additional support required by children and young people who are able pupils. The Scottish Government also funds the Scottish Network for Able Pupils to support the development and sharing of good practice in supporting able pupils. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. As the Cabinet Secretary will know, at several Royal Society events in recent years, there have been interesting discussions about how best to support particularly gifted and talented, talented pupils from all parts of the country and all social backgrounds in order to ensure that they receive specialist teaching appropriate to their needs. Will the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that gifted children in whatever academic discipline are vitally important to the development of Scotland's economy and could he update the Parliament on what support is being provided? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I acknowledge the point that uh, uh, Alison Harris makes and uh, recognise the, uh, the, 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 the significance um, of able and gifted pupils being able to make a significant contribution and to um, fulfil all of their potential within Scotland. Now, the Government currently funds the Scottish Network for Able Pupils, which is a network of support to schools and teachers um, to assist through the sharing of ideas and practice to enhance um, educational support for such young people. Um, SNAP also runs um, workshops for young people and provides advice to parents to assist them in that respect. A number of resources have been developed for practitioners and parents to help them to support highly able children, including a number of what are called snapshots, which can be used as a starting point for developing activities for highly able learners. Uh, Alec Rowley. That's okay, sorry. Question number 11, Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what training opportunities are available for people over the age of 25. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Skills Development Scotland, our national skills agency, provides professional careers advice and training support to individuals of all ages. And we also fund and work support via the STUC Scottish Union Learning Programme. We support people into employment through a range of programmes, including modern apprenticeships, skills, training, employability and work experience through the private, public and third sectors. I, I thank Sandra the Minister White. for that reply. Uh, I know a problem amongst other members also. I've had many constituents over the age of 25 who find that uh, they can't get apprenticeships or get into training opportunities. And I thank the member for, for giving me that reply. But can you perhaps, Minister, provide assurances that uh, the people over 25 will be afforded perhaps the same uh, level of opportunities as those at the moment under 25? Yes. Well, uh, let me thank Sandra White for her, her supplementary question. Clearly, I don't know the specific circumstances of her individual constituents. What I can say to her is that there are, in fact, a number of modern apprenticeships uh, frameworks with, uh, that are specific uh, uh, frameworks which uh, do allow for those over 25 to be eligible. There's a, a, a long list of them here, uh, President Officer, which I'll be happy to provide to, to Sandra White. Separately, what I can also say is that at the end of October, uh, I uh, committed to assessing if we can we look at embedding further flexibilities across other uh, frameworks and uh, I'll always be willing to consider uh, if there's other things we can do but if uh, Sandra has any specific issues with to do with any specific constituent or indeed constituents or indeed any other member they can write to me I'll be happy to, to look at what we can do. Question number 12 Mark Roskell. Thank you presiding officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will issue guidance to schools regarding how the money raised through its council tax reforms can be spent to raise attainment levels. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, next month we will launch a framework of fully evidenced and proven educational interventions and strategies to help tackle the poverty-related attainment gap. The framework will inform the decisions schools make to spend the additional funds and we will monitor the impact on improving children's progress. Mark Ruskell. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and I, you know, I welcome the uh, production of the framework. Um, I think regardless of the reasons why councils find themselves in very difficult financial circumstances at the moment. The fact is, Cabinet Secretary, that they do. And you'll be aware yourself that there are cuts taking place right now to SLAs and additional support across Scotland. That is having an impact on the workload of teachers and their ability to innovate, particularly around literacy and numeracy, Cabinet Secretary. So will you ensure that schools are able to spend funds on whatever is appropriate to drive attainment? That could be filling gaps in SLAs, additional support for learning or behavioural support. Cabinet Secretary. The, the, the first thing I'd say is that um, I um, acknowledge the relationship between um, 
teacher workload and the ability to deliver learning and teaching, which closes the poverty-related attainment gap. So I accept that there is a connection between these two things, which is why I've spent so much time over the course of the last few months trying to reduce what I would describe as the unnecessary teacher workload. Um, that will, of course, the purpose of that is to create the space to enable the concentration on learning and teaching, which Mr. Ruskell has highlighted in his question. And of course, I acknowledge that uh, many of the techniques and interventions that Mr. Ruskell has raised will undoubtedly be part of the framework that we bring forward and which we would look to individual schools to take forward uh, to make a profound impact on the educational attainment of young people. So um, I, I, I accept the line of argument that, that um, Mr Ruskell makes of the importance of uh, schools being able to make these judgments and the framework that we put in place will assist them in so doing. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what specific steps have been taken to reduce teacher and pupil workload and what role the new benchmarks will play in this? Cabinet Secretary. The, the purpose of the new benchmarks is to ensure that we address the, um, the uncertainty that exists within the teaching profession about the levels of achievement and attainment that should be, um, um, should be marked by young people at different stages in their educational journey and um, the feedback I've had from, mem from members of the teaching profession is that the benchmarks that have been published so far have significantly enhanced uh, the ability to do exactly that. Um, those uh, benchmarks will help to give um, clarity to remove some of the workload that's been created in trying to search for those answers by the teaching profession and then open up opportunities for a greater concentration on learning and teaching, which is exactly the point I was making to Mr Ruskell in my earlier answer. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Could you confirm whether or not some of the money that's raised in one council for the attainment fund could actually potentially be spent in another council area? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, uh, as, as, as Liz Smith, uh, I would have thought would have been aware, um, all council tax money um, raised in a local authority area will be retained in that local authority area. That's the uh, position the government has set out. And of course, what we are engaged in is a discussion with local authorities about how we take forward the, um, the wider implementation of this policy commitment. Uh, but all uh, council tax money raised in one area will be, uh, will be retained in that one area. Question number 13, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update to its plans to review the Protecting Vulnerable Groups scheme. Minister Mark McDonald. Uh, the Deputy First Minister spoke at Disclosure Scotland's stakeholder event in Glasgow on Monday, uh, where he outlined the broad themes the PVG scheme review would look at um, digital delivery of services, uh, the importance of safeguarding vulnerable groups and financial sustainability of the scheme. Uh, between now and the end of February 2017, Disclosure Scotland officials will continue engagement with stakeholders to develop terms of reference for the review. Uh, once that work is completed and the terms of reference have been agreed by ministers, uh, I will write to the convener of the Education and Skills Committee and arrange for the information to be provided to SPICE. Stuart Stevenson. Um, that is a very welcome and uh, up-to-date uh, set of information that the Minister has provided. Uh, Disclosure Scotland obviously plays a very important part in ensuring uh, that uh, vulnerable groups are protected. I wonder if the Minister can provide further information about how in particular he might to see the disclosure system itself uh, emerging from the review that is now being undertaken. Minister. Uh, well, obviously the review will cover both aspects of the 2007 Act, namely the listing and barring functions under Part 1 uh, and the vetting and disclosure functions under Part 2. Um, in terms of what Mr Stevenson is saying, I think the, the important thing is that we ensure uh, strong stakeholder engagement uh, as part of the review. Um, during the stakeholder event that I spoke of on Monday, officials offered attendees the opportunity to become involved in the work to devise the terms of reference for the review, uh, and 39 individuals representing organisations organisations in the regulatory, public, private and voluntary sectors uh, in Scotland signed up. Um, officials will take forward further discussions with those individuals, uh, with Who Cares Scotland, uh, Recruit with Conviction and also with members of the Disclosure Scotland Stakeholder Advisory Board with a view to presenting terms of reference for the review to me uh, by the end of February 2017. And I think that would be the appropriate point perhaps uh, to respond to Mr Stevenson in relation to where the review uh, will cover once we've had the opportunity to flesh out those terms of reference. 
Question 14 has not been lodged. Question 15, Gordon Lindhurst. To ask the Scottish Government what effect it anticipates leaving the EU will have on university student numbers studying in Scotland. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. The continued ambiguity of the UK Government on the future immigration status of EU students and students from across the world for that matter is hampering planning by universities across Scotland. We have responded to university and student concerns by ensuring that current eligible EU undergraduate students and those starting courses next year will continue to be entitled to free tuition. However, the UK Government needs to share its plans for the immigration status of the EU and other students urgently. Gordon Linders. Over 13,000 EU nationals studying full-time degrees at Scottish universities in 2014 to 15 were funded from the same public pot as Scottish students. <coughs> Audit Scotland has recognised that Scottish students are finding it increasingly difficult to access university. If, and it is only an if of course, EU student numbers fall, will the government be better placed to meet its own target for getting more Scottish students from poorer backgrounds into university? Or will it continue to fail on that front? Minister. Well, the, the number of um, Scottish domiciled students um, fro from poorer communities is indeed rising, and the government yeah, is yeah, committed yeah. to ensuring that we will follow all the recommendations of the Commission for widening access, and that will improve that still further. It really does beg our belief, though, that the, the Conservatives are trying to ask the government to make a policy on what happens when we don't know what the immigration status of EU nationals will be, we don't know when any change will happen, if it will happen at all, and what the actual um, timetable for any of the, the Brexit negotiations will be. Um, with, with that background coming from the UK Government, it really is a bit rich to ask a hypothetical question for the Scottish Government to take a decision on EU national students. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. And the Minister brings up a valid point. Does the Minister agree with me that it is quite rich for a Tory MSP to come to this chamber and ask the Scottish Government about the impact of something the UK Government has, uh, colleagues has caused? And does the Minister agree that the decision by the UK Government, like refusing to include Scottish universities in the post-study work uh, visa pilot scheme, are deeply damaging to our universities? Minister. George Adams. Uh, George Adam uh, raises a very um, um, important point, and as I responded to, to Gillian Martin earlier, the, the decisions that are being taken by the UK government um, on immigration um, are highly damaging, whether that's our exclusion from the English Tier 4 visa pilot um, and the, the implications that are coming from the Home Secretary that somehow we should further limit the international students that contribute so much to our economy and our community. And I, we will continue to press the UK government to introduce a post-study work visa for Scotland that meets the needs of our communities and our universities. Question 16, Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what are its plans to ensure that every child has access to their entitlement of 1,140 hours of free childcare provision. Minister Mark MacDonald. Uh, we've published a blueprint for 2020, the expansion of early learning and childcare in Scotland consultation, which sets out the Scottish Government's vision for transforming early learning and childcare, uh, which is underpinned by the four principles of quality, flexibility, accessibility and affordability, and seeks views on the key policy choices required to deliver this vision, uh, including future funding options and models of delivery. Uh, we will publish our response to the consultation in spring 2017. Peter Chapman. I thank the Minister for that answer. However, birthday discrimination still remains a problem and charities such as Fair Funding for Our Kids continually highlights this issue. Surely the Scottish Government can agree that it is unacceptable that which month you were born in can dictate your allowance of childcare. Minister. Uh, well, Peter Chapman uh, raises a point which the Conservatives have raised uh, on more than one occasion. Uh, however, it is worth noting that local authorities have the flexibility uh, to offer early learning provision to those children that he cites should they choose to do so, and in some local authorities they do just that. However, in order for this to be applied across the board, we estimate that it would cost in the region uh, of £26 million over and above that which is currently being spent. If the Conservatives wish to spend extra money, they have to come to this chamber and tell us where they would find it from. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Could the Minister outline how much money the Scottish Government has provided to local authorities 
to deliver 600 hours of free early learning and childcare, and how much of this funding councils have spent? Minister. The financial review uh, of early learning and childcare was published uh, in September, uh, highlighting that we had provided £329.2 million of additional revenue and £170 million of additional capital to support the delivery uh, of the expansion of entitlement to 600 hours. Uh, the review indicates that over the same period, local authority spending uh, on early learning and childcare uh, in revenue terms increased by £189.1 million, while capital spending uh, was £17 million in 2014-15, capital funding of 71 million was provided in that year. Uh, while COSLA has provided new information to the Education Committee, uh, we consider the original figures provided to us, uh, by, which were provided to us by councils and reported in the financial review, remain robust. Uh, but we will, of course, study COSLA's letter and information with interest, and I'm sure the Education Committee will continue to maintain its strong interest in these matters. Uh, but what is obviously clear uh, from uh, the information in the financial review is that we have fully funded our commitment in terms of early learning and childcare. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions.